Hey y'all, it's Sarah. I have a super fun, super, super, so simple um, Christmas craft to share with you guys today while I'm crafting. This was one that I did not even have planned, but I kind of had to do it. And I figured if I was doing it, I'd see if I um, had anybody that wanted to tag along and, and kind of play with this idea with me. So let's go ahead and get started. I have got a few things laying out here. I'm going to try to actually do this beginning to end normally i do the paint tutorial separately this is such an easy craft i'm going to try to show you guys beginning to end so let me dive in tell you what we're going to be using and run with it from there so the first thing i've got is um this is two of the white ready board brand foam core strips i have them cut down lengthwise at three inches so these are three by 30 inches um, these are going to be my framing pieces and I'm just going to cut them down. I typically cut in three inch spans anyway, so I'm going to be using these to cut them down and you'll see what I cut them down to. Uh, the paints I'm going to be using is the Waverly Wax and Clear, the Waverly Wax and Antique, and Waverly Chalk Paint in the color Ink. I'm also using some of the Ready Board brand Foam Core in Black as my backer. You don't have to use black. Um, I typically like to use black, on, especially on something this simple, just because I don't have to paint out my backside for it to kind of look finished. Um, this one is cut down to uh, fit the surface that I'm going to be applying to it. It is cut down to a 15 by 18 backer size. So that's what's going to fit my particular project. If you go with another gift bag, you'll be able to fit yours to size just using your measurements and kind of everything else will be the same. So um, that brings me to the gift bag I'm going to be using. I got this one at Walmart and you can see it has this awesome um, galvanized kind of look to it. So this is the one I wanted to use. It's going to look like I have metal and I'm going to show you kind of how I did this. The one other thing is, is that I'm not going to trim mine down, even though it's going to have these holes in it when I remove my ribbons. And I'm just going to use some scrapbook embellishments to fill those holes rather than to trim my little um, edge down. Because if I did, I would lose kind of this green trim around the edge and I didn't want to. So you'll see what I do with that. Uh, I think that's everything I'm going to be using. I'm going to be using um, just a regular... Um, craft style glue stick uh, and you'll see that and I'm also going to be using just some Dollar Tree hot glue so let's go ahead and get started first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the ribbon off my gift bag and I'm kind of just going to shove this in there um, I'm just going to cut my front side and you'll see there's it's two-sided so uh, if you can work your creases out, you can probably use both sides. I have to play with that. My only concern with trying to use both sides on this particular one is this kind of metallic looking paper definitely holds the crease, but I only need one of these. So I'm just going to go ahead and trim this down. Okay, so to trim mine down, I'm just going to take my razor blade and see if I can um, try to cut through both sides at the same time and I'll pretty much separate this bag and I'm going to go as close to the edge as I can with my really sharp blade that I usually use for foam core so I'm hoping that'll work out I'm not sure about the thickness since this does kind of have this metallic finish to it it does feel like a really nice thickness on this gift bag if you just wanted to use it as a gift bag well I didn't go through both layers but I did get through my first layer so that works for me I forgot this was longer than my poor little broken ruler so let me bring this big one in here and I'm just going to go through and do that all the way around the edges and just get this surface paper okay so here I am this is where I stand I've gotten all of that cut loose nicely you can kind of see how that worked out for me the last thing I have is I'm going to go ahead and cut this little flap off Honestly, it really is not going to be a big deal either way. If you do, you could still glue it down, but I feel like I'm going to get a nicer um, 
flatter adhesion to my backer board if I go ahead and take that little bit of extra thickness away. So I kind of wanted to note that. The cool thing about it is it just folds down. It doesn't, um, it wasn't glued down. And I really like the thickness of this. Um, I've already played with the Dollar Tree calendars, the farmhouse style calendars, and they're a much thinner paper, so I'm kind of happy with the thickness on this one. I'm going to bring in my backer. We're going to go ahead and adhere this down, and it'll have time to set and dry while we're painting our frame. And I'm just going to be using, um, I've got an Elmer's Craft Bond glue stick. Um, you can use, honestly, you probably can use just a regular glue stick. Uh, I like using the glue sticks because they're fast adhesion. They're really flat. They have a low moisture point. So your paper or your foam core, neither one are going to bubble up on you. And you can almost get this one to make it adhere um, like wallpaper. You get a really... Uh, good coverage with your glue this way and it helps apply it much nicer so I'm only going to glue part of that for the moment get it kind of stuck in place and you can see that I cut my backer slightly larger and I did that so that I would have room for my framing and my framing is going to come in and um, hit these edges I'm going to take a popsicle stick now I've got Cricut tools and um you know, the scraper tools. For some reason, when I'm doing this, I really get a better adhesion, a flatter, smoother adhesion on this soft kind of squishy foam core using the popsicle stick. And I don't get a lot of indentions. I don't get um, much of that problem. It's not scratching up my paper surface, any of that. So now that I've got it kind of stuck, I can come in and kind of put it on my black surface here so that I personally can see it a little better. And if you go outside the lines on this, on this part, along these edges, past your paper, that's going to be fine because we're going to be gluing our frame to that. So you can see I'm just steadily doing that. I'm going to try to get full coverage and then finish using my popsicle stick to really rub this down nicely and you can see what a nice adhesion that's already making right there so i just kind of wanted to show as i get this last little bit laid down guys i'm loving 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 how nice this goes down and really looks like a sheet of metal is here um i kind of wanted to show this part just so you could see that and even though i'm going to put something in these holes i wanted to get it attached first um what I'm using to put in here is scrapbooking brads. And had I just attached it to the paper, um, those brads have wings that spread out and it would have left a lump there. So I'm actually gonna go all the way through my foam core. And the ones that I'm using, um, and I've shown you guys to use carpet tacks, um, regular tacks, if you wanna have some kind of metal looking hardware on your pieces. These are brads and you can find these in the scrapbook section of Michaels and Hobby Lobby and that kind of thing and I'm not sure if you can see that but they have a flat head and a Phillips head screw look on there so I'm just going to pop these in my little piece and I'm using the Phillips head so that it really does um, you really get that vibe of it being screwed down and these just go in super simple but you'll see what I mean about these little kind of wings at the end you're once you pop them through you spread them out and if I had done that under my paper it would have left like a little bit of bulk under that paper as I went to stick it down so let me pop these little guys over oh that one only has one so if you're worried about these coming loose typically it's not a problem if you're worried about them coming loose just pop a little hot glue over that part and it's fine. So there you go. Now you can see kind of how that worked out. I'm going to put this to the side and pull out my paint. And we're going to go through. Let me slide this down a little. We're going to go through and do um, 
our painting fun. Okay, I've got all my paints out, the ones I typically use. I've got my little setup here. Um, if you haven't seen the setup and why I use it, there is a video for that. But it has all the paints that I showed right at the beginning. It has my antique, my clear, and my ink. And I'm going to be using sponges to paint this. I'm just going to go in and do only a little bit of distressing, maybe. I've just popped in and got a little knot hole on there. In order to do that, I'm using my fingernails and I'm kind of creating two parentheses um, across from each other. Not a full circle, um, you know, just a semicircle each direction. And there is a trick to that. I know that some people have had some problems when they go to do it and their piece starts to crease. And a lot of times you can work that crease look into your piece. But in order to prevent that, you're not wanting to put a lot of pressure first as you break that surface you want to break that surface first and then put your pressure down so more of your pressure is going down into that foam so the corner of mine if you see it's breaking that surface immediately and not bending it and that really is where you get those looks where you're have a kind of a crisp um knot hole without a lot of the the creasing and wrinkles banding out from it um, the next thing i'm going to do is just find something pokey same thing though i'm making sure that my surface is broken i don't want this one to be too busy but i did want to show it um, so that's all i'm gonna do i may add some nail holes to it and i'm just gonna use something small to poke it right in those corners my next step on this, let me grab my gloves so that my hands are protected and I'm going to start painting. There's lots of tutorials up for the painting process. I'm using the one that will equate to, um, I think the salvage barn would look. So, um, check that out if you want more details. I'm going to kind of just briefly run through this. So if you notice my little thing right here says mix. And what this is a mix of is actually all three paints. Barely some black, um, some of the antique, and barely some clear. And this allows me to do my edges where they blend into this two-tone color that I'm about to paint fairly nicely. Rather than just trying it with the brown, just trying it with the black. I keep a nice little mix of that to do all of my edges. And you'll see it's a much deeper brown than the kind of reddish toned brown that comes out of the antique on its own. And I'm going to go through and do all of my edges. We'll still have more edges to do when this is said and done because we're going to cut this down. So let me go ahead and finish out these edges and I'm going to show you the paint process. All right, so you can see all of my edges are nicely done. There's a little paint seepage, a little bit of mess, and this is where we're going to clean that up and make this look like a wood piece. Um, really quick tip, if you can see, I have glued um, some foam cord down to my desk at this 30-inch length because I always work at the 30-inch length. Um, so now my little pieces, they don't slide. I've got one at each end that you can't see, and I actually have one here down at my waistline that keeps them from sliding forward and this lets me do my strips without leaving a lot of fingerprints if you can't glue things down to your desktop um, and a lot of people can't my desktop is a rolling chair protector so it's already seen better days get a large cardboard box that um, you can use as a paint surface and attach some pieces down because this really is if you're going to do a lot of strips it's such a time saver and you're about to see that um, and for me, it's a big deal because I tend to do fingerprints, and if I even try to cover mine, I still end up with glove prints. So I'm pulling out the antique. I'm pulling out my sponge that usually has antique on it. I'm just going to add a little paint here. I'm not going super heavy because I am going to make this a layered color. I'm going to hit my little indentions a little bit. And if you notice, I'm not even having to touch these boards. And see, you can see that was where my darker brown that I, my mix, you can see it's a little bit darker than this antique. It's more of a brown and this has a little bit of that honey red to it. So I'm coming in with this antique and I'm kind of hitting this surface 
in a graining fashion, I'm putting pressure with these first two fingers on my sponge to kind of change out that, that grain there. I'm not going to go super heavy on this because I want my blacks and grays to kind of show up. Put a little paint there in, in my little indentions, my little um, kind of grooves and things. And this one you can go as light and dark as you want. You can add the layers. That's the great thing about these paints in this combination is they allow you to really layer on your paints and see each layer individually. So I've got that done. That's about all I need for the two of these. And you see, I still never had to use this hand to hold any of that. Love this method. Usually I can stack several boards at once and hit them that easily. Next, this is my ink color, which is just their name for black. Um, I'm going to go in with my other sponge and my clear. And I always go heavier kind of with my clear than I do this ink color. One, this ink is very, very heavy pigmented. Um, the ink mixed with the wax allows us to really work it across that surface. And like I said, I was working towards that kind of barnwood gray. And I really thought that this, this deeper um, color worked well with the bag that I'm using. I thought it looked really nice with um, the kind of galvanized look that that had. I'm just coming over here to this edge, pushing some of this paint down into those knot holes. So I'm going to come here with my knot holes and I'm going to put a little paint on them. And I usually will show you to do this with a makeup sponge. It's just easier to control, but if you feel confident doing it this way, you can use it this way. And I'm sliding this across to kind of drag that color across that knot hole and make it a little more subtle. Um, and I can do the same thing here with my little gouges. Put a little of that darker pigment in there. Drag that down. And this whole time that I'm sweeping this back and forth, I'm steadily putting different pressures there with my fingers, um, using this like a tool to get that graining look. So I'm pretty happy with these. I'm going to show you um, the next step is I'm just going to trim these down. This is how I save myself from trying to paint a whole bunch of smaller strips. Uh, when I want to do a frame for something, I'll do my three inch strips because I keep a lot of these. I sit and cut the three inch a whole lot at one time. That way I have plenty to play with at any given time when I get the urge. And I typically use them at three inches unless I'm switching for um, a particular craft that I need another size for. So with these being three inches, I want my frame to be an inch and a half. Um, I wanted a little thickness to it. I thought the sign could, could really handle a, a little bit thicker frame than maybe the one inch or the one and a quarter inch that I typically use. Uh, I really do want that rustic vibe, so I thought a little bit more wood on it would be good. Uh, so let me get my cutter. I have brought my Logan Compact Matte Cutter in. Uh, I've done a video on some really cool tools and things. This is one that um, I kind of want to show a little bit more just to get people a little more familiar with it and decide whether or not it's something you think is uh, worth investing in for you. I love mine. You guys will see I use my razor blade all the time when I'm doing smaller projects, but uh, it is a great help if you're really diving into this. So the way this works is kind of similar to a regular paper trimmer. It's got the little arm that holds things in place. This one allows you to cut up to about four and a half with it helping you and having that guide. You can still free cut on it by removing it. I'm going to move this down to an inch and a half where this little triangle hits. And if you have really detailed questions about this thing and where to find them, those kind of things, check out the cool tool videos. It really has some fun little things on it that you could um, be putting to some good use if you're really into this craft. So 
I have put it down to this one and a half. I locked it in place, so now it's not letting any of that budge on me. I'm gonna come in. I've got my little handheld cutter that um, the newer models of this, they, they come in a set where you get the handheld cutter. Mine is a very old model, so I had to purchase mine separately, and you can purchase them separately. Um, online or Hobby Lobby carries them also. They've been running excellent deals. I'm getting it in its little tracks right here, popping it on there. I've got my little board down here against this stopper. Uh, sorry, didn't realize you couldn't see the stopper. I've got it down here. I've got it pushed against that stopper. And seriously, this is how easy this goes. Perfect. Both of these now will be a perfect one and a half inches. Same thing with this one. You'll see how fast this goes. I am not telling people to run out and buy unnecessary tools. Um, for me, this is almost a necessary tool at this point. But I do love the convenience. Um, and it makes it so simple. And I can be really confident that my cuts are going to be good. So I'm going to move this out of my way and show you how to cut these down. So this is the part that most people seem to struggle with. And while I do have um, a little handy tool that allows me to do this a lot easier, I am going to show you the alternative way. And a lot of times I will switch either which way of doing this. So I'm going to show you how to measure this out. This is where I know people are struggling. I've got my four strips. I'm going to bring my piece in. Now, in order to keep, one, from blinding you with this glare, and two, um, from getting any residual paint that's not completely dry on there, I'm going to flip this over to the back side and just use the back side to show you. In order to get your size for your framing strips, whatever your final piece is going to be, um, it doesn't matter what the size is, this one's 15 by 18, um, so whatever that is, that's what you're going to follow as far as your measurements go. I know that's the probably the most asked part about doing this. So you're just going to have your pieces cut down to each side. So when I get done with this, my pieces are going to be 18 inches here, 18 inches here, 15 inches here, and 15 inches here. And let's go ahead and do that. Okay, here we go. You can see how that works out. Um, hopefully, they really are very perfectly aligned with their edges. There's no overage, none of that. Um, it's as simple as that. Just cut it to fit each one of your lengths. And this is where we run with it. So, I'm not going to show it through every piece. I'm not going to make you drudge through that. But, I do want to show you kind of how to do this whole 45 degree thing. My width of my frame is one and a half inches so knowing that i'm going to come over one and a half inches from my end and mark that so the the height and the width well there's going to be a perfect little square there oops if i measure it right there will be a perfect little square there sorry so now you see there is a square that is one and a half inch this way and one and a half inch this way. And this is going to work no matter if you're doing two inches, three inches. As long as you keep that measurement as you come over a perfect square of whatever you're cutting on, this is going to work. So on that perfect square, if you go from one corner down to the other on the diagonal, I'm going to bite into it on my mat first and pull it down into that so that I'm getting really crisp cuts on this um, little edge and there you go that's a perfect 45 I'm gonna switch this over and to do to do the other end I'm gonna do the same thing I'm gonna come over mark that one and a half inch get my perfect square the only thing is now I want to pay attention to my little point I want to make sure that this long point comes along the same edge and let me cut that and you can see what I mean we'll have long point on long point and short point on short point and now you can see 
we want that longest edge and for this one because this was my 18 inch piece if you look i never really changed any length on that it is still at the longest point 18 inches all i did was remove length from one side by doing that so i'm gonna go ahead and cut down all of these pieces and we'll fit them in place here we are every single one is cut down with 45 degrees on every end if you lined it up this is kind of what you should get with an end result now doing that cutting those down we now have this raw edge these raw edges and that kind of thing this is where we want to go ahead and take care of those before we glue this down the outer ones would not be so hard you can always come in at the very last and do it these you want to go ahead and do just before you glue down because you can't do these after and while I'm doing that, I wanted to show you how to go ahead and pop in your nail holes. Now that I have them ready and aligned, I'm actually just going to do this with my pencil. Anything that's going to kind of get down in here. I want to say, though, after these have already been painted, be more cautious. You could have aligned this. Um, if you can think that far ahead, you could do it while you were painting. But since I did the three inch pieces then cut them down it's a little harder to do that so i will be able to kind of handle this as i'm um, painting out these edges so if you can see i just popped little holes in there where nails would likely be on a frame and i'm being careful because now this painted surface um, takes damage a little more um, easily and after it's been painted it can want to peel up on you a little more easily so this is where my little mix container is so super handy i'm going to come back in i'm using my kitchen sponge that i like to do my edges with because it doesn't tear up as easily for me those edges are sharp and they rip my nicer sponges apart you can kind of see on this guy where it's got cuts in it from those edges but it's still holding up so um that's kind of why you'll see me switch back and forth between the kitchen sponge and um, the bath sponge so this is where my mix works nicely because with that kind of darker mix it allows me to get a better match to this brownish gray look and i'm just going to come in and do these edges uh, and if you get some overage like that which I went ahead and did anyway, just so I could push that paint in there. I'm gonna slide a little of that paint back off. I went a little heavy handed. Um, this is where I tell you guys about pulling paint back. Whether it's your bath sponge or another kitchen sponge, just a sponge that has not been as wet and um, saturated as this, go back in, slide the dry one off, lift some of that paint back off. Uh, that's an easy easy solution if you feel like you got too heavy or you went a little clumsy with your paint usually on that first dip into your paints it's easy to get a little heavy-handed but once you keep your sponges saturated that works out a whole lot easier so now you can see that that little bit of um, paint product down in those little holes now you suddenly look like you've got some some nail holes going on there so I'm going to go through and do that with all of my pieces and allow them to dry a little bit because I don't want my paint transferring on my finished product. And I'll be right back, guys. So I think my pieces have had enough time to dry where it's not a huge panic. My piece has had enough time to dry. You can see how nice that went down. I love this. So love this. Try not to get too hyper and excited on this. The last thing to do is just come in and put our framework in. Um, I usually suggest go in, do a dry fitting, make sure that your angles are good before you start gluing down. And I work my way all the way around instead of doing opposites to opposites. I, I don't know why I do that. I feel like it gives me a little more wiggle room on, um, on putting mine together, but whatever works kind of for you. So when I do these, now, I've been asked if I spot glue. I do not spot glue. I do pretty heavy, especially on the parts that are going to go along my edges because I want those edges to seal down really well. Over here. And not have a whole lot of gaps. 
So if you just spot glue it, you're liable to have more gaps in between, more bowing, that kind of thing. So I tend to heavy glue it down from edge to edge. I definitely get my little corner points. And that way when I go in and I paint those, those final sides there on those edges, there's not any gaps between my thin little frame and um, my backer piece, and it's a little more believable. So I cut mine slightly larger because I wanted to be able to trim it down if I needed some wiggle room to work around here. Um, mine is going to end up being just a hair um, to be trimmed off, and I think I cut mine at like 15 and a quarter on the honest side um, that way I I feel better about being able to trim down than having overhang on the back side and let me make sure I've slid this into place and I let that stick down too fast so now this is why I say um, allow for a little wiggle room there at the end. So I'm going to try to wiggle this little guy up into place and get him fitted. I want you to see how those nail holes end up resulting while I'm wiggling my little fella in place here. Okay, got my last little guy wiggled in place and got him glued down. And I want to explain why I said that I left a little bit of playroom with the 15 and a quarter by 18 and a quarter instead of just full-blown going that size because I wasn't sure I didn't measure out my bag remember I said I just cut it from edge to edge I wasn't real sure once I did that if I came over a quarter of an inch on one side or the other I needed to be able to play with that ordinarily you literally would just cut it to size 15 by 18 um, only because I wanted to fit it to a framing where I got to keep my little green trim on this piece um, was the only reason I did it that way on this one. And when I do pieces like this, I tend to give myself a little playroom extra around. So the last thing we have to do for this is I'm coming back in with my, my little darker mix. And I will paint in these white edges all the way around on my um, my backer piece and for this one since I used a black one I don't even have to paint the back I don't have to finish the back and here we go this is so super cute I love this it's such an easy piece um, you could with most of the bags you're gonna be able to do um, probably a matching set of each thing this one only came a problem because of that crease um, that was in this kind of metallic paper and it was really going to show up a lot of other papers you could work that crease out and not even notice it especially if there was a good pattern there that hid that crease it's our final piece and the idea is not new you guys have seen me do it with other stuff but I really had to do it with this one and show you guys that this bag was out there that once it was done like this it really does look like a metal sign um like I said, this was Walmart for this bag. I want to say it was about 247, 248. I cannot remember. I was so excited when I saw it. I think my brain just kind of stopped. But here you go. Here is a, finest, a final finished project. Very little effort. I totally love it. I hope you do too. I hope it inspires you to start looking at your bags. Um, there's a lot of boxes that were super cute. It was just this one in particular drew me in because you end up getting a result that looks like a framed out metal sign. So if you have any questions, drop them below. I'll try to add any relevant videos and I hope you guys get to craft soon. Bye y'all.